question right here, and while the microphone is coming, um, I'm going to ask a question myself to both of you. As a layperson whose science education ended around the 12th grade, <laughs> how do I decide between competing scientific theories that involve a great deal of knowledge that, that I don't necessarily have or that I may not be willing to invest the time to, to read several books on both sides of every scientific matter? How should I decide what to think about scientific issues? Well, at the risk of uh, sounding like a plagiarist, I would say be skeptical. <laughs> oh, no, that's all right. I'll make you an honorary member of the Skeptics Society. Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, I would not trust the uh, consensus of the experts, uh, as I wouldn't trust the consensus of experts on almost any other topic. Uh, I would give it tentative approval, perhaps, but I would remain skeptical, especially when there's as much controversy about it as there is about Darwinism. I deal with this all the time for, for my job at Skeptics, with any claim that comes down the pike. Uh, like the most recent one on 9-11, the, 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 the World Trade Center buildings, you know, shouldn't have collapsed the way they did if a plane hit. That, they, were, they collapsed the way they did because of uh, planted explosions inside, these little squibs that went off and so on. Well, I don't know anything about why buildings fall, so I had to go you know, read and do research and, and look it up and talk to engineers and so on. And it was pretty obvious within, you know, five minutes that the, the conspiracy theorists are completely wrong. But at every point, you had to check like that. So you, you go to the experts. Now, yes, the experts can be wrong. But that's what other experts are for, which is why we're seeing, I think, there's two new books out on string theory, Not Even Wrong and, and I forget the name of the other one. But they're both skeptical of string theory, and legitimately so. Within the confines of science, scientists going after each other. Uh, and uh, so you just sort of have to weigh the balance of, you know, which, which experts are saying this or that or skeptical of each other, or is there a general consensus? With plate tectonics, for example, and continental drift, there was little consensus until uh, the mid-1960s when there was a convergence of evidence and it became so obvious that this had to be going on and there was like six different lines of evidence that all pointed to one conclusion. I always looked for, David, that, that sort of convergence of evidence in which the They've, the outsiders are picking at one little thing, ignoring this mass body of evidence that points to this one conclusion. All right, right here. Uh, my name is Inlay. I come from India. Uh, as far as I understand, science is self-corrective and never claimed perfection. Whereas all religions that depend upon the holy books like Quran, Bible, Vedas, they claim perfection and the name intelligent design is nothing but camouflage of God. So whatever you say, uh, with the sweeping remarks and without any humble nature, which science claims, uh, I think is not uh, standing. And to teach intelligent design to students is uh, making a very harmful thing uh, in future and also in the past. Well, I've already said that I think it's premature to teach intelligent, intelligent design in science classes. I do, however, however, think that Darwinism should not be taught uh, uncritically. Uh, in fact, uh, I agree with you that science is tentative, but uh, many of the classes I've attended or other people I know have attended about Darwinism are anything but tentative. So I think there's a problem there. Okay, in the back. Uh, I have a question for both of you. First, for Dr. Shermer, you said that we had to keep searching until we find a bottom-up explanation, and I want to ask why. I mean, what if the truth about the universe isn't that there's a bottom-up explana bottom bottom explanation for some things, or maybe all things? And uh, secondly, for Dr. Wells, what do you have to say to the co-option argument that, if you could remind us of what that is, and that Dr. Shermer made, and what do you have to say about that? Yeah, good question. Uh, well, first, in general, uh, when we talk about the philosophical underpinnings of science, that we look for natural explanations. It's not that there's some rule that we all adhere by or there's some science czar that says you can't do otherwise. It's that there's nothing to do with non-natural explanations. There's no way to test them. 
Uh, let, let's take a, a less controversial subject. Well, maybe not. But anyway, psychic power. You know, people believe that you know we can read each other's thoughts. Okay. Well, you know, I'm skeptical of this. Uh, that there's even anything to explain. But let's say actually there was something to explain. There was some statistically significant tests, and turns out some people really can read other people's minds. And and, and then somebody discovered a theory about it. That uh, that in fact, and this isn't a legitimate theory. That at the quantum level, there's certain uncertainty states inside these little microtubules inside the neurons, and and, and in those little sort of vacuumed uh, vacuum states, that there's a certain level of uncertainty that causes neurons to fire randomly, or in certain patterns, if we all think collectively about a certain thought, like peace or ending the war in Iraq or something like this, and it all directed. Let's say somebody actually discovers that there is some interaction between at the, uh, quantum mechanics and, 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 and neuroscience, and we now have a legitimate theory. All right? The paranormal has just disappeared. We've just debunked the paranormal. We now have a perfectly natural explanation for how people can read each other's thoughts. That's the ultimate fate of the paranormal and the supernatural. It's just gone when science comes up with an explanation. So it, it's just the way it is. It's not that anybody says it has to be that way. And the, the co-option question, uh, the co-option idea is that something that may have evolved for one purpose is then later co-opted for another purpose. Uh, Mr. Shermer used the example of wings, uh, feathers actually, proto-feathers. Uh, the current hypothesis is that wings evolved, birds evolved, that is, from theropod dinosaurs. Well, a theropod dinosaurs built something like a T-Rex, only smaller. If you've ever seen Jurassic Park or been to a museum, these are animals with big, heavy hindquarters and tiny little for forward limbs, front limbs. And somehow, the idea of co-option is that they sprouted proto-feathers, which were like hairs, and then somehow natural selection evolved these feathers, co-opted these proto-feathers and these mini forward limbs uh, to turn them into wings. Well, I find that an argument from, if you will, credulity. Uh, we've, uh, we skeptics have been accused of the argument from incredulity. I think that's an argument from credulity. It's just totally implausible. So where do you so think we from? I don't pretend to know. But I don't say that we have an answer, and the answer is co-option. It just doesn't work. Michael, the Washington Post reported yesterday that 30 percent of Americans believe the Bush administration raised gas prices earlier so they could then cause them to drift down <laughs> toward Election day. Have you investigated this hypothesis? No, I have not, but that's a good one. I like that. <laughs> Actually, my taxi, tri di taxi driver yesterday in New York did mention that, now that he's said that. It apparently is widespread. Uh, 